dancing and drinking and partying and having a good time? Okay, well, I'm going to try to inject some ex in excitement into this session to keep you awake, keep those eyes open. Um, we have uh, quite a packed session this morning, and, and I know that uh, usually doing workshops, you're used to uh, doing activities together as a group and, you know, doing uh, more, um, I, 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 don't, I don't know, tactile kinds of things. But there are some uh, ideas and thoughts that I want to impress upon you this morning and leave you with um, uh, at this conference uh, that I, I'd like you to think about and to take into your practice. And these are not just easy thoughts about matters of culture and, and the practice of occupational therapy. Um, these are ideas and thoughts that really uh, are critical in terms of how we fulfill our mandate of client-centered occupational therapy. And an occupational therapy that is just and, um, and helpful, truly helpful, to the real kinds of struggles that our clients and consumers of our services uh, experience. So um, without uh, further ado, let me now just start into uh, the slides. Now, just a, a shameless 15-second uh, uh, <laughs> advertisement for something else that I do. Uh, and uh, I'm known these days for uh, the work that I've done with something called the Kawa model, or the river model. Kawa is Japanese for river. Um, and uh, the, the talk that I'm giving this morning uh, blends quite well with uh, the Kawa model work. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about the Kawa model very much this morning. So if you have any interest in the Kawa model, um, there's all kinds of information that you can find. Probably the most current information on the Kawa model uh, can be found on Facebook. So go to Facebook and put in Kawa model, and uh, you'll uh, see what, is, uh, what has uh, developed in the Kawa model world uh, from all over the world. Uh, and uh, hopefully it will be helpful and thought-provoking as well. Okay, all right. Now, there are a number of things that I want to try to <clears throat> cover this, uh, this morning in, in just this 57 minutes or so that I have left. Um, but one critical part of uh, this session is to try to understand or get a grips with how we understand and discourse matters of culture in occupational therapy and in our practices, as well as in our own lives. So I'm going to talk about where we locate culture and the consequences of where we locate it. And then uh, hopefully that will lead to a critical understanding of these matters of cultural sensitivity and cultural safety, concepts that appear in the description of the session. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have enough time to explore some of the strategies uh, for delivering a more culturally safe practice of occupational therapy. Okay, so let's uh, move forward. All right. <laughs> so uh, I think we're in Scotland, and Scotland is famous for many, many great things. And uh, how many of you don't know what this is in the middle of the screen here? There, I, I don't think there are any meat products in here. Well, maybe there might be. There might be. Okay. You all know this as a? Wow. I think a new model of occupational therapy has just been born uh, here at COT. Yes, uh, I understand that it's a deep fried Mars bar. And before I leave Glasgow, I'd like to experience one of these. I probably need a shot of insulin or something at the same time. OK, so if we were to build a new Glaswegian theory of occupation, uh, we might call this something called the Mars model. And as you can see on here, life is like um, <clears throat> a deep fried Mars bar, uh, <laughs> battered on the outside and just, you know, fried to. I, don't, I think this was pulled out prematurely, or maybe this must have been, you know, refrozen or something, because all of these elements inside seem to be neatly compartmentalized. But I think the real thing would result in everything kind of mixing all together and being kind of gooey and messy? Well, we might say then that uh, the outside part of this is the environment, and the inside part of this is the person, and then 
that part that mediates between the inside and the outside, between the person and the environment, is something called occupation. And the remarkable thing about this is that if this is your life explained through this particular model, um, uh, at, at, at if you were to cut this Mars bar at different points along the way, it would reveal a unique configuration of the elements that are inside. You might have a piece of a nut showing here, or you know, a little bit more caramel in one area, and, and a little bit more whatever the other stuff is. But no matter where you cut it, it's going to reveal a different configuration, a different picture altogether. Very much like our lives. If we were to explain, for example, that our lives are like rivers. They start up in the mountains, and you know, the rains fall on the hills, and the glaciers melt, and what starts off as a stream makes its way down toward with gravity uh, toward the great sea. And anywhere along the way, if you were to cut that river and look at its cross section, it would reveal a different configuration, such as it is with our lives from moment to moment to moment. How you feel and how you look at the world and how you feel about yourself and how you feel in general, for example, changes from moment to moment. It's very much an interaction of the en environment around us, what is happening on the inside, and the processes that bind the two together. Now, models, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that models are metaphor. Uh, they're metaphorical, and in this case, we're talking about a deep fried Mars bar uh, being representative of life. And um, a metaphor is just very briefly explained um, using an, an idea or image to describe or explain another phenomena of interest. Um, these metaphors and these models don't fall from heaven. They're not these perfect narratives that we can use in every situation. Rather, metaphor is actually, um, well, if I interchange it with theory in occupational therapy, um, they're metaphorical as well as cultural. Let me just explain what is in the pictures here. Um, whenever we talk about the mind being like a machine, or we talk about uh, the self, uh, or occupation as uh, it, through something, a framework like general systems theory. It conjures up images of, of, uh, of uh, machines or uh, parts that precisely fit together and move in unison. This is a, a Kawa model drawing that's gone awry from I don't know why the arrows are pointing down this way, but something happens when the version of PowerPoint changes, I think. And then, of course, if we want to uh, explain something through the idea of a hierarchy, we might use an image like a pyramid or a triangle or something like that. Models are metaphorical, and because they don't fall from heaven and they're not universally uh, <coughs> applicable uh, things, they're also, what I say, cultural. So somebody like me sits down and creates a model. Where does that model come from? It comes from me. And where do my ideas come from? They come from a lifetime of experience, of learning all kinds of things, of taking things in through my environment, through the uh, view of reality in the world that I have developed over time. And then when I encounter an idea like occupation or human occupation or occupational therapy, then what I'm doing is I'm taking concepts that are in my mind, putting them together through principles, and then coming up with something that's relatively simple, hopefully, to explain that phenomena of interest, which is occupation. So these, are, these models and these metaphors have meaning because they're within our realm of shared experiences. Culture. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I just want to just pause for a moment and show you a similar slide uh, to what I showed you during the plenary session a couple of days ago. Uh, all of us in this room here are bound together. We are all occupational therapists or students of occupational therapy. And we're bound together by what I refer to as our magnificent promise. And that is to enable people from all walks of life to engage and participate in valuable activities and processes of daily living. 
being able to follow through with this mandate or this promise is daunting. It is very, very difficult. And why is that? It's because the lives of our clients, just like your life and my life, is extremely complex and special. And the way that we look at occupations and we look at the things that we do in everyday life and the meanings that we attach to those uh, events uh, differ from person to person to person. And uh, so uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we are cultural beings and that culture, the matter of culture, is very central to our ideas in occupational therapy, in occupation, and all of the other concepts that we have. Okay, so just very brief, what I've just shared with you may be a little bit different to how you've understood culture over time. So for many people here, culture has been synonymous with race, ethnicity, and other kinds of categories that we human beings have created. Um, sometimes we equate it with food, fashion, and the arts. So if you were to have a cultural evening, it might include going to eat sushi at a Japanese restaurant and then, and then uh, you know, going to some kind of a, a cultural fair or going to the art gallery or something like that. Um, often we've referred to culture as, as uh, being um, uh, associated with a matter of cultivation. So that if we were to say that somebody here was cultured, that they would be seen to be a, a person who maybe is very knowledgeable about the world of contemporary issues, uh, knows the difference between what a fine Merlot is and what a Cabernet Sauvignon is. Um, I don't know what the difference is between the two, but uh, maybe they drive an Aston Martin DB5, like James Bond, <laughs> and travel the world in first class, and uh, have season tickets to the ballet, and, and so on. A cultivated life. Well, um, I think that probably it's the, the matter of cultivation that I think uh, rings true to me as I study the concept of culture myself. And so, <clears throat> leading to that notion of cultivation, this is another very common way in which we make sense of culture and culture in occupational therapy, unfortunately. And that is that we view culture as an embodiment. That it's something that is static and stereotypically associated with a person. So we might, somebody might look at me and say, oh, he's Chinese, or he's Asian, he's Japanese. Oh, he must eat with chopsticks and speak English if he can with a heavy accent. Um, and um, he must, you know, bow a lot and uh, like to go around in groups and follow people with flags <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, so on and so forth. And yet, um, you know, here I am, I was born and raised in Japan, but I, I've been socialized into North American life so much that many of these mannerisms and, uh, and uh, stereotypical behavior patterns have changed as I've acculturated into a different context of daily living. And so, um, Sometimes we have, and in our past, if we look at our literature in occupational therapy, we have actually, we have articles that say if you are treating a, for example, a Hispanic person, um, then make sure that you don't talk about this or make mention about how they're dressed because Spanish women, uh, Hispanic women are very modest and blah, 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 blah. It's as if somebody has made this rule around the fact that that those attributes, those patterns that we see in behavior are somehow embedded in their DNA and that uh, uh, it's too late to change the software and to refigure it and to, to uh, you know, update the firmware. Um, uh, contrary to that, I believe that uh, people are not uh, that way, that we are certain vessels that, that acquire um, uh, various views of the world and various ways of uh, acting on the world and, and uh, how we make sense of the world and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to mention that and that's certainly what I'm going to veer away from in this uh, talk. I prefer a definition of culture that goes something like this. Culture is 
stands for spheres of shared experiences and the ascription of meaning to the objects and phenomena that we encounter in the world. So what does that mean? It means that if all of us in this room were to spend a lot of time together, um, we might um, experience a lot of similar events together, and we might also then derive some common meanings of what those events have meant. Now, just a few minutes ago, I made some comments about Japanese people walking around in groups following somebody with a flag. That doesn't happen so much these days, but back in the 19, early 1990s, that was almost always the case here in Glasgow or London or you know, wherever here in the UK. Um, but uh, <clears throat> now, why did I go off on that tangent? Uh, <laughs> uh, this will happen from time to time. It's jet lag, and it's, um, <laughs> but I can't say that I was drinking last night, so I have no excuse. But I mentioned that, well, I'll, I'll, I mentioned that simply because for those Japanese people, in their sphere of experiences uh, that they have acquired over their, their lifetime, that it's a very, that's what normal is, and that's very meaningful. And, and when you go on trips abroad with other people, uh, this is what you do. You find your place in the group, and uh, there's a code of behavior, and so on and so forth, that you follow. Here in this group, if we were to spend a lot of time together, uh, we might even come to some common understandings about how we interpret words like occupation, you know, in a way that everybody else out there in the world doesn't see occupation. We talk about it being all of these wonderful things. Through occupation, we can affect the state of our own health. Um, doing, being, becoming. And then if you were to step outside of this conference uh, center, and talk to somebody and ask them uh, the concept or the word of occupation. What, com what comes to your mind? And they might say, well, are you talking about my job or my career? Um, or they might notice that the person talking to them is Japanese. And they might say, oh, is this uh, something to do with uh, what you all did uh, in uh, Manchuria and China, Taiwan and Korea when you forcibly with your military uh, went into those countries and occupied occupied their, their, their land. Are you talking about that kind of occupation? <laughs> no, doing, being, becoming, and you know, all of these great, wonderful things. But um, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, when, we, uh, when I talk about culture as spheres of shared experience, that culture is something that we share, that it's not something that is just an embodiment, but rather something that is navigated, negotiated in the spaces between us. And um, not only that, when we get together and we have common experiences, we have a tendency to also ascribe or give common meanings to the objects and phenomena that we encounter in the world. Now, I remember why we talked about the Japanese tourists in, in a group. Uh, it, it, uh, there was a little bit of a chuckle. Sometimes when I mention that, the whole hall is howling with laughter. Uh, I had wished that that had happened, but um, I guess I just didn't presented to you in a culturally uh, <laughs> provocative way. <laughs> but I'll come back to that a little bit later. Okay. So if we, um, you know, here in, in, in our profession of occupational therapy, uh, put much value in uh, occupations and how um, they're meaningful to us in a unique way, I think that it really requires us to try to understand this whole business of meaning and how we make sense of the world around us and uh, with our interactions with each other. Um, uh, so I want to shift gears a bit and just take you down a pathway where we kind of consider where these basic ideas of truth and reality come from. And uh, so uh, what I mean about this is that uh, I'm talking about a debate that's been going on for centuries amongst the greatest thinkers of the world. They're also still to this very day arguing the very, same, the very point of where does reality and truth exist? So how do we make sense of truth and reality? Uh, well, I want to start off with world views and, uh, and ask the question, do different world views exist? So when you all in this room, each of you, when you are 
viewing this presentation? Are you seeing this presentation, viewing me, evaluating me, making sense of me in the same way as the person sitting next to you? Some people might say, well, yeah, no, basically, uh, we're getting the same message here. Are we not? Well, worldviews may, uh, may differ. They may not. But depending on how you interpret that, it has profound implications for how you do occupational therapy and make sense of it. So let me explain. That whole question about where reality exists where truth exists, does it exist in here or does it exist out there in the world? Here's one way of looking at it. Reality existing out there external to the self. And that is that truth in the world is universal. It's static. It's pretty stable. It doesn't change very much. And we can know that reality out there by validating or verifying it objectively through our senses. So if we can see it, we can say it's real, it exists. If we can touch it, that's even better. If we can smell it, even better. If we can hear it, yeah, it's real, it exists. Now, this is, I, I love showing this picture. This is a picture of my, my daughter was born in Japan. Her name is Michelle, and here she's not even two years old, and she's seen the ocean in Nova Scotia, where, where we moved to from Japan. Um, Nova Scotia is in Canada on the Atlantic coast, and she's seen the ocean for the first time in her life. And here's this strange man ex explaining reality to her. That's water and uh, NaCl and uh, uh, salt, that is sodium chloride. And um, there are fishes in there, and uh, sharks, and things like that. And uh, see, you can smell it, you can hear it, you can touch it, you can see it. It's, it's real. <coughs> that way of thinking and making sense of the world is also what underlies ways of knowing in the fields of science and biomedicine, as well as in rehabilitation. When we have a sense that we can view the phenomena of health as embodied in the individual. We see it as pathology. Something is wrong. Something is broken. Something's not quite right in that person's body. And in order to make sense of it, we take that phenomena and begin to break it down into knowable parts. So this process that many of us call reduction is we take these complex holes of phenomena, and then we begin to break them down into small bits and to even smaller parts uh, with this understanding that if we can under, if we know what's going on in the small parts, we can all, we can put this all back together again into a whole to understand what is going on and even give a diagnosis to it, a label that we've created to, to uh, signify or to, to name it. And uh, it's as if there is an underlying tacit um, agreement or understanding that everything in the world has been logically put together according to a grand design and that uh, if we want to know that better, we just have to break it down. This is why we have all kinds of diagnostic instruments and all kinds of gold standard assessments that we use to verify um, for sure that this is what is going on. And God help you if they can't find what it is that's going on in your body or in your brain because they'll say, take a few of these and come back in, in a week's time uh, to see if this thing persists. Um, because you're probably imagining it because we can't objectively find it. Okay. Um, so click. Okay. I don't know why that didn't transition. So um, what you see up here in the screen and this round circle up at the top is uh, a depiction, at least a graphic depiction, of something called the um, primitive cosmological myth. And what a cosmological myth is, 
is uh, a narrative or some kind of explaining of everything. The universe, heaven, earth, self, uh, our places in, uh, in, 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 the, in the realm of, of it all. The kinds of questions that you asked when you were teenagers, you know, going through puberty and you're taking a shower and massaging your scalp, putting the shampoo into your hair and asking all the big questions in life. You know, who am I? Why do I exist? Why did I have to have parents like these? <laughs> you know, what's the meaning of it all? Is there life after death? Where do we go after we die? Um, is there a God? Uh, if, if so, please help me, you know? <laughs> um, so cosmological myths are these narratives that kind of explain it all. And if you travel the world and go to different places and talk to indigenous peoples of the world as well as people in industrialized countries and in the West and in the East, there are all kinds of variations of the cosmological myth. And there is no one cosmological myth that says it all for everybody. But what I would like to say is that in Asia, in Japan, for example, where I'm from, this is the view of the cosmos that we learned, that all things are connected together, integrated, that the individual is not separate from the environment. But in the West, uh, the European tradition, and all through for the, for the time since at least the time of the Enlightenment, I think it goes back even further to the Old Testament times of Moses going up Mount Sinai to meet with, with God. That's the, the, um, the first evidence that I can find, uh, a narrative that explains a particular cosmological myth that differs very much from the so-called primitive one. And that is in which uh, this integrated whole is separated out rationally. And we have a separation of the spiritual world, or in this case, an omnipotent God, and then God's creation. And it can be broken down into the self, and then the rest of society and everybody else. Everybody is precious under God, God's eyes, but at times it feels I'm the most special person. And then down below here is something else that has been created for us, and that is nature and the environment. And um, it has been created for our pleasure, uh, I understand. Uh, we're also supposed to be good stewards of this, but we're just proving time and again that we're lousy stewards. We like to kind of use and throw away things and wreck the environment, and now the environment is changing. So here is a different uh, uh, narrative. Uh, it's referred to in the literature as Western cosm cosmology. Uh, and I wanted to point that out because this rational separation and also something else that I forgot to mention is that not only are these categories created, but they are also then ranked in a hierarchy of value. And um, God is usually the standard that we use, the ultimate standard, but often we like to play God. And these rankings that we make of these categories, often um, those distinctions, those rankings are made by the most important, omnipotent uh, part of that system. And uh, in this case, it might be me. So whatever I decide is most valuable, closest to me, uh, is what's best, and everything else kind of, kind of follows. The old um, Victorian museums of natural history is a very nice study of that because usually the exhibits are arranged in a way in which you go from simple life forms all the way through to you know, in invertebrates and then you go on to organisms that have a backbone and then on to those that either lay eggs or have live birth and then you get finally to the primates and then toward the end uh, there are human beings at the very top of the scale. So there's this ascent of civilization, you know, and uh, it's no, no um, coincidence that that whole narrative was written by a human being. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to cut through some of these slides. I don't have to spend as much time talking about it, but uh, what I just want to say that is that even our systems of knowledge and the, know uh, and the knowledge that we, that are venerated in this part of the world, um, if you were to go to another part of the world, uh, you may encounter a whole different system of, of truth, um, uh, of ideas and ways of looking at the world that carry even more validity to those people. So um, I won't uh, spend much time, but I just wanted to point out that all of these people are white people. <laughs> and so when Japanese people are growing up and they're learning about the great philosophers of the world, um, and they're looking at people like uh, Lao Tzu or um, Confucius, um, they kind of look a little bit different from, from this lot. <laughs> these are the, some of the greatest thinkers of the world that uh, that we have recorded uh, in our history books. And uh, many of these ideas inform uh, the main ideas in occupational therapy. Okay, come on, slide. Theory in occupational therapy. <clears throat> this is a common narrative that runs through uh, much of uh, what is worth knowing in occupational therapy today. And that is that if you look at any model or piece of theory of, of occupational therapy, it's very common to see something like this or a variation of this. And what do I mean by that? Well, usually you'll see a person. Usually the person's in the middle of the universe, okay, the individual. And they are here as a distinct entity. And the environment is treated as a separate and distinct entity. And it's like we acknowledge that the environment is there and that we are in the environment, but, there, but still there is a, a line of demarcation, a border between what constitutes the self and what constitutes the environment. And as thin as this line is, we've now created in our narrative in occupational therapy that we need this yellow arrow. And that is what I would call, what we call, occupation. So the self acts upon the environment. And depending upon how well and how effective um, the self can act on the environment, um, we can determine how occupationally, how, how well they are performing in terms of occupational performance. Okay? And if there's a problem with this, whether in the human or whether in the environment, then occupational therapy can come in and somehow try to fix those parts so that this interaction between the self and the environment can be put on balance again. Now imagine what it was like for me to go to Japan as an adult to help establish one of the first bachelor's programs in occupational therapy there. And for them to look at me to teach them theory in occupational therapy, something that they had great difficulty understanding. And I thought, well, it's very simple. It's about the self and the environment and how through occupation we engage the environment. And through that interaction, we can affect the state of our own health. They couldn't understand that. And when I start, started to probe it deeper, consistently, my students were asking me what this yellow arrow was. And as I dug further, they then revealed to me that, well, they ask me questions like this. If the environment is in me, a part of me, as I am a part of the environment, if I'm in the environment as the environment is in me, what do you mean by this line that separates the two? And if there is no line in our understanding, what's the value of this yellow arrow? Why do I need that? So, when e East Asian people talk about karma and how things are going to happen if they're willed to happen, well, that kind of, I guess, takes away some of the power of the self to be the author of your own lives and to be able to, you know, manipulate your world and your circumstances uh, to make everything go the way that you want it to go. So the main narrative in occupational therapy, the main uh, conventional models and theory that we have, they may resonate with us in our sphere of shared experience here in the Western world, where we've learned the self and the environment in a particular way. 
There are a lot of people, in fact, the majority of the world doesn't quite understand this. The situation in Japan is such that they have no word in their lexicon that explains all of the wonderful things that we ascribe or attribute to the concept of occupation. So it's existed there, occupational therapy has existed in Japan for almost 50 years now. And still to this very day, they can't come up with a better word than the word sagyo um, to mean occupation. Uh, the word for occupational therapy, therapist in Japan is sagyo ryohoshi. So um, ryoho means therapy, occupational therapy, sagyo ryoho. Sagyo literally means tedious, laborious, repetitive work. <laughs> Honestly. So how would you like to be occupational therapists in Japan? <laughs> tedious, laborious, repetitive work therapists. <laughs> yes. That's substantial. So here we are chuckling about it, but I just think, you know, it's, it's kind of, well, unfortunate in, in many ways. And that's why still to this day, um, occupational therapy in Japan is very much reduced to uh, a very heavily uh, a medical model influence practice. Um, they will learn the theory by rote. They memorize it. And if you ask a Japanese person, what's the definition of occupation in your language, then they will tell you what they've memorized from a translation in Willard and Spackman or some other textbook. Occupation is, but they can't quite anchor it to something really meaningful and real in their own lives. Okay. All right, so we're moving along here. Uh, in the plenary, I talked about how occupational therapy, uh, the, the profession, is a cultural entity. We have a shared system of language, common learned values, tacit rules of conduct, and so on and so forth. And so this slide was just to show that uh, our occupations in daily life are unique. They're contextual and they're shared. And now I want to get to the meat of uh, what I came here to talk about in the remaining time. Um, got about 20 minutes or so, I think. So here's the East Asian cosmological myth. And now, this is an exercise that some of you in this group have already gone through, but I want to somehow make this the central part of what I want to talk about. This isn't quite it. I, I was at breakfast this morning at the hotel, and they didn't quite have this. Do you know that there's a difference between this and this? So what is this? A satsuma? A mandarin. Anything else? Clementine? A nachi. Oh, my. Well, I'm just proving my point here. We're all looking at the same object, and yet, yet everybody has a different way of calling this what it is. And that's probably because in your sphere of shared experience, of your own shared experiences with others, that this is what you've come to know this. Maybe in your grocery store at Tesco or wherever you buy your nachis or your satsumas or mandarins, that's what they're called. Ah, what I call it is universally true and right <laughs> for everybody. It is called a mikan. This is a mikan. And uh, if I were to say that in Japan, they would all nod and agree and say, yes, of course it's a mikan. But it's not just a simple mikan. They would take a look at the size of the, the stem button up here and then how prominent the pores are on the peel, how large it is. They'll ask me, is it bigger than your fist, sensei? <laughs> uh, uh, what its fragrance might be a little bit like because they're trying to determine which one of 51 known varieties of this fruit that this might be? Is it a tankan from, uh, from southern Kyushu? Is it uh, an iokan from the island of Shikoku? Uh, all of these places produce a, a, a variation of the, the same fruit, but they all have certain common experiences around it. So here we are, we have this concept, or rather this object, and we all have come to understand it in slightly different ways. So the more important question is, and I'm just going to fly through this, the Japanese. Of course, you already anticipated what the Japanese refer to it as. 
And those of you who live here locally might also refer to this as a nachi or maybe a satsuma. You know, it's interesting. Satsuma is the name of the, the dominant samurai clan of, um, of Kyushu, the, the southernmost island of, of Japan. And um, how it got to be named Satsuma. <laughs> It just sounds pretty good. If we had time, I'd, I'd give you some traditions and some stories around what the Mikan means to the average uh, Japanese person, what their experience around it is. But more, more importantly, if we were to exchange that object for a concept, for an idea, such as well-being, do you, or more importantly, do your clients make sense of the idea of well-being in the same way? What about the concept of occupation. So we just spent the last 15 minutes or so talking about this. And I think you all know what my view is on this, is that no, we all have unique and different ways of making sense of the world and making sense of these concepts. Um, some of you have come across various theories of disability. Some have come to understand disability as an embodiment, something that resides within that person, so that if you see a disabled person, you would say, oh, oh my goodness, it's unfortunate what happened to this person. There's something wrong or not right in that person's body, and that's why they're in a wheelchair. That's a, that, that forms an idea that, that somehow disability is a phenomena that resides in that body, in that person. And then there are others who are advocates for something called a social model of disability who say, no, there's nothing wrong or pejoratively wrong with that person. It's how society is, how we've configured society and the environment, how we've made decisions about how we want to build environments that cater to 2.5 standard deviations from the mean. So there, therefore, our doorways are going to be this high, and our seats are going, going to be approximately this size, and our sidewalks are going to be built like this, uh, and so on and so forth. Had we done it differently, how we configure work and expectations at work and, and how we work and so on and so forth, many of these phenomena that we refer to as disability would actually disappear. So are these distinctions that we make about people resident in those individuals, static, unchanging, just there? Or are those distinctions and the meanings that we as ascribe to those things actually resident within us? Huge implications. So I guess what I want to say is this, is that throughout our, our lifetime, we acquire a kind of a special lens through which we view the world and make sense of the world. And may I just say that these lenses that we put on are populated by all of the experiences that we've had uh, in our life, even before we were born, probably. The sensation and the things that we learn from our parents who are around us. Uh, what we learn from watching television, from going to school, going to church. Uh, what we learn now through Twitter and social media and so on and so forth. All of these things come together that give us a sense of what normal is and what reality is and how it's configured in our lives and how we make sense of things. This is what kind of, kind of informs us as to whether what we're looking at is beautiful or unsightly and ugly, whether what we're looking at is... Um, uh, uh, good or bad, morally right or morally wrong, depending on the lenses that you've acquired. Maybe an issue like uh, abortion, uh, you know, is about um, killing babies. And yet it may be viewed from a different set of lenses as a very complex issue for women. Um, what's good, what's bad, what's beautiful, what's not so beautiful, and so on and so forth. Um, when we view our clients, here are the implications. When you view a client that comes in through the door that we have in the past maybe referred to as being culturally different, maybe it's the way that they're dressed, or the way that they smell, or the way that they're acting, 
and how they're answering your questions in the intake interview or how they're not answering those questions. Whatever it is, maybe you might notice that your client is remarkable for some kind of reason. And um, um, those remarkable features and the meanings that go with those features, uh, I want to ask you and challenge you right now. Are those features resident in that individual? Or are the features that we see as being remarkable, carrying all of these different meanings, are they actually resident in the lenses that we've acquired within us? And so when we go about doing occupational therapy, are we actually going about trying to cultivate that person to reach and become like us, to follow our notions of what normal is? Or is there a need for us, our lenses, to be cultivated, to understand that person in the realm of their day-to-day -day realities as interpreted by them? Do we need to cultivate uh, our sense of that? So at the very beginning, I talked about uh, metaphor. And, uh, and I, I did that on purpose. And I was alluding to, I guess, a work that I'm so familiar with now called the Kawa model. The Kawa model was developed because of this very problem of how we take a cultural entity like occupational therapy with all of its subsumed values, its views of the construction of the self and of the environment, all of these imperatives and expectations. When we take those ideas and proceed to foist those unwittingly foist those onto our clients without taking the time to really understand their narratives. I mean, we say that we're client-centered, but how client-centered are we when we feel that we are, with best intentions, trying to help the individual by taking all of these requirements that are based on someone else's reality and then proceeding to then cultivate that person to reach our norms, my norms. It happens subtly, sometimes innocuously, it seems, when we take standardized assessments, things that we regard to be gold standards. And we encounter our clients and we say, how is your day-to-day -day life going? I'm the occupational therapist. I have a BSc next to my name. I've been to school longer than you. And I understand occupation and rehabilitation and all of these things better than you because I'm the learned professional. And, um, but how often do we pay lip service to the client's narrative and what they have to say? And then proceed to say, I actually know more about what you need and what your realities are. Um, and I'm going to explain it now to you. So when we take theory, concepts, and just blindly use them, um, we take these beautiful narratives that our clients have and then proceed to force those through these sophisticated concepts that we have created in our world. Words like volition, self-efficacy, personal causation, occupational performance, and so on and so forth. Take those raw narratives and then proceed to cram them through these sophisticated concepts and then write up our report and our assessment of what's going on with the client. And we've changed the narrative to the point that if we were to take that narrative and show it to our clients, they would not even recognize their own lives in what you've just written. But we've done this as a matter of customary practice. We don't question it. We just believe that it's inherently good. And I think that we're now coming into this period of time, some people call it the postmodern condition, relativism and all these things that I talked about the other day, um, social media, um, how um, ideas uh, that, that originate in one part of the world all of a sudden get tweeted out to all of these different places, different spheres of experience, different contexts of understanding, um, to the point where we're in a better position to understand that, hey, those people way off in Australia or 
across town in Burnside, for example, may have a different way of viewing this phenomena that I'm actually talking about. There's a lot of work to be done in the field of occupational therapy. We didn't have time to get into, you know, concepts of cultural safety and those kinds of things. But with the remaining a period of time, I want to jet forward now to, well, I can't end this without talking a little bit about power because I've just started talking about it. But we often use our instruments, our models, our theory in occupational therapy uh, as universal narratives, as if everybody views the world, experiences occupations in the same way. And uh, really what we're doing is that we're taking a one size and style of shoe fits all type of approach. And we're proceeding to then use that as a lens to make sense of our clients. I was going to talk about my experience of being categorized into the yellow category of the red, yellow, black and white schema that somebody created um, <laughs> in their world and um, didn't get to that, but um, just pointing out that many of our models carry all kinds of features that reflect uh, norms in, in Western life. And um, it's a shame that we didn't get to this, but you can read about this in some of the work that I've done uh, about what happens when we put the self in the center of the universe and how that affects how we view time, how we view um, ourselves in the world in terms of uh, agency and uh, about the need to be in control of our circumstances and how we evaluate that in terms of how we make sense of uh, ability and disability. But uh, I've talked about our profession, where our ideas have come from. And uh, I've talked also about this, about our clients saying, what about my experience of daily life? I won't get to the ugly, uh, um, uh, idea and concept of, of colonialism, but I do want to talk a little bit about power. Um, just want to refer back to the point about uh, um, the work of Irihapiti Ramsden uh, in New Zealand who gave us the concept of cultural safety. Uh, Dr. Ramsden, sorry, Dr. Ramsden was uh, a nurse scholar of Maori descent and uh, uh, really, her work was very controversial at the time, but it's gaining more and more traction these days. Uh, she looked at the fact that uh, even though the white settlers of New Zealand, with best intentions, tried to help Maori people with their problems uh, around health, that uh, uh, consistently the Maori were being um, reduced to and described in very pejorative terms, such as, oh, they're the people with high levels of diabetes, heart disease, uh, violence, uh, domestic violence, on and on and on and on. So that every report that came out of a study of Maori people uh, was uh, disadvantaging them. Um, it got to the point where a lot of Maori people were dying uh, as a result of inadequate care. And uh, so Ramsden was basically saying, look, uh, for health care to be safe for Maori people, it needs to be culturally safe. And ideally, it'd be great if a Maori person was a practitioner that actually, you know, gave us the care. But I think the most important point around cultural safety is the number, the third point down the line here about health professionals interacting with clients in such a way that those who receive the care are able to define it. So what do we need in occupational therapy? We need methods that include the client in the care that they receive not to follow this familiar pattern of us being over here on this side, dictating the terms of practice and the concepts by which we're going to evaluate them and to do things with them or to them down to the client. And the client ends up saying, well, what about my reality? What about my story? Is an occupational therapy about my experience and my struggles in daily life? What about the consequences of my medical diagnosis on my day-to-day -day realities? So the key to culturally safe and sensitive practice, as I finish off the last few minutes, um, are depicted in D. 
these last two slides. So we want to be able to understand the complexity of our clients' experiences from their vantage and in their words. We want approaches, tools, and frameworks that enable a view into our clients' contexts from the client's view of normal and through common shared meanings or metaphor and through a reversal of power. And how do we reverse that power? We try to privilege as much as we can our clients' narratives. So here we are. And uh, we have, for example, the client here being able to express their daily reality from their sense of normal. And we have the therapist here who needs to cultivate their understanding of the client's daily normal. How do we do that? We, do it, we, can, we can do it through common spheres of understanding. So what is it about the client's cultural view and your view, your cultural view as a therapist, what do you have in common? I use usually the example of the Kawa River model because if the client can convey their experience of daily life through the concept or through the idea of a river, and if you can understand that metaphor also, there is a better chance of you being able to understand or both of you being able to understand one another. So this is just one example. And in conclusion, I want to say this. If we are to move toward culturally relevant and safe theory, epistemology, and practices in occupational therapy, we need approaches that are relevant to people's daily needs and realities, we need to be able to understand the power structures and contexts in our processes, to critically re-evaluate relevance of our knowledge bases to uh, the realities of our clients' daily lives, to develop models of practice that enable and empower clients. The Kawa model is not it. It's just one example of the kinds of works and frameworks that we need to develop in our profession. We need to rethink client-centeredness from the client's perspective and to appreciate clients as inseparably embedded in unique contexts. So um, it's been a very, very fast moving morning. We're now completely out of time, but here's the take home message for uh, today. The path to culturally safe occupational therapy well, the distinctive features you see and judge in the other are actually artifacts in your own cultural lens, informed by your own spheres of experiences, and not the static markers of distinction ascribed to the other. It's about cultivating your own worldview and understanding of the client and their needs. If you can take care of that, you'll be culturally sensitive, you'll be culturally safe, safer in your practice, and uh, working toward a much more just and um, inclusive and uh, effective occupational therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you, huge. Thank you to Juan Bilbao for getting us to think at 9 o'clock in the morning in such a sort of lateral and creative.